This is Q&A with Prof. A, the Ibato Ke Dokbato Medical Physiology Review Series for Students. The question thrown to us today is, Prof. A, what is the difference between volume and osmolarity disorders? Volume and osmolarity are two distinct but very related concepts in renal physiology. Knowledge of their differences is critical, especially in the management of fluid and electrolyte disorders. Sodium disorders deal with volume change while water disorders affect osmolarity. The body fluid compartment that is affected by sodium disorders are your ECF, while water disorders affect your intracellular fluid space. Regulation is primarily through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system with sodium disorders, while for water or osmolarity problems, it is your antidiuretic hormone axis. From your renin angiotensin aldosterone system, renin secretion is triggered by low BP, low sodium delivery to the macula densa, high sympathetic nervous system activity, and its only role is to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. While angiotensin 2 constricts the efferent arteriole and increases the sodium hydrogen exchanger activity. It leads to increased proximal convoluted tubule sodium reabsorption. It also constricts vascular smooth muscle, releases aldosterone, and stimulates thirst and ADH secretion. The major stimulus for the release of aldosterone is hyperkalemia. Angiotensin II also acts as a major stimulus for its synthesis and release. Aldosterone acts on the distal tubule and collecting ducts, particular sodium potassium ATPase pump to enhance sodium absorption by your epithelial sodium channels. It also causes the secretion of potassium and to a lesser extent hydrogen in exchange for sodium. Aldosterone therefore leads to the conservation of sodium and the excretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. In essence, the principal effect of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is to decrease sodium and water excretion. What happens with high salt intake? The kidneys can only excrete about half of the high sodium intake in a day. The remaining slightly increases the volume. This then inhibits the sympathetic nervous system activity to decrease sodium reabsorption. It also inhibits angiotensin II and aldosterone. It stimulates now your atrial natriuretic peptide release from stretching of the atria. The increase in volume also increases arterial pressure, enhancing sodium excretion or your pressure natriuresis. If the humoral, neural, and intrarenal mechanisms cannot cope, this will lead to edema and hypertension. For osmolarity, the ADH axis is active. Arginine vasopressin, AVP, or ADH, is an octapeptide that is synthesized in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. It is released when there is an increase in serum osmolarity of around more than 280 mL osmos per kilogram water, or becomes severe with decreased blood volume by angiotensin II. But there are non-osmotic stimuli, such as nausea, vomiting, exercise, anxiety, fright, pain, nicotine, and anesthetic agents that increase secretion of AVP. Followed by ADH, it is your thirst mechanism. Its osmotic threshold is much, much higher than ADH, more than 10 milliosmoles per kilogram water, or around 300 milliosmoles. For this to work, your brain center for thirst should be intact and there is access to water. Sodium or volume disorders usually affect the body fluid compartment of the ECF, which is composed of your interstitial space and plasma volume. Therefore, the clinical presentation will be dermatologic and or cardiovascular from sunken eyeballs, edema, hypotension, or even hypertension. Well, for water disorders, it's usually the ICF that's affected. And we all know that the brain is primarily water. Therefore, the clinical presentation of osmolarity problems is usually neurologic in manifestation, with thirst as an important symptomatology. 
They can also be euvolemic, hypovolemic, or hypervolemic. The laboratory test that we should use for sodium disorders is your weight, which is your total body sodium. While for osmolarity disorders, we look at the serum sodium, which can be hyponatremia, which is excess of water, or hypernatremia, which is loss of water. We need to remember that sodium loss is not equal to hyponatremia. Hypovolemia is not equal to dehydration. Your CVS symptoms like pulses and interstitial fluid signs such as sunken eyeballs or poor skin trigger is not equal to dehydration. And your total body sodium is not the same as serum sodium. For patients with volume problems and they present with very low plasma volume, the choice of IVF is isotonic to replace the sodium loss. While if there's an excess of sodium, we give them a hypotonic fluid which has around 75 mex of sodium a day. For osmolarity problems, if they present with hyponatremia or excess of water, to prevent that, we give them isotonic fluids. And if they are symptomatic, 3% hypertonic sodium chloride is given. While for patients who are dehydrated from loss of water or hypernatremic, we give them hypotonic fluids or water to replace the water loss. Bear in mind that 3% sodium chloride is not the same as your 0.3% sodium chloride. This is where it is important to differentiate sodium from water disorders or volume from osmolarity problems. How fast or how slow you give your fluids will determine the outcome of your patient. Volume disorders, we give the fluids as fast as possible to restore intravascular volume. While for osmolarity problems, to prevent sudden water shifts in the brain, we give them as slow and as calculated as possible. Correcting hyponatremia and hypernatremia quickly will lead to either cerebral edema or pontine myelinosis. While if we very slowly correct hypotension or volume problems, it will lead to a lot of failures from the heart, kidney, liver, and even adrenal glands. The mantra in fluid therapy is volume first, so resuscitate rapidly. Then osmolarity by rehydrating rationally and carefully. But never forget to replace any losses regularly and remove routinely any excess sodium and water. For more high-yield concepts in renal physiology, don't forget to click the subscribe button.